social media is just such an interesting topic to me. I, I actually work in it. I live in it. I, I breathe in it. I, you know, do my own social media content. And so I'm just thrilled to be doing something that I love and I'm passionate about and being able to be here with you on the stage sharing with you. So we'll get right into it. I'll give you a little bit of background on me. I have uh, seven years of corporate experience. I, I started my professional career in oil and gas. Obviously, we're in Houston, and I'm a Houstonian. I have a finance degree, but none of that, you know, was, was really my path to uh, social media. My path to marketing was really, I, I took a leap of faith. I leaped into it. And I discovered social media early on. So tapping into it early gave me the ability to teach myself about self-branding, about content very, very, very early on. So my marketing background is actually uh, 15 years. Uh, I have 15 years of marketing background. And when I say I leaped into it by accident, I mean that I was at the right place at the right time and just took a leap of faith. And um I started my professional career as a luxury lifestyle membership salesperson in a private members only club. And this was back in 2009. Instagram hadn't come out. LinkedIn had just came out, rolled out, and Facebook was up and coming. And I started documenting my journey. And before I knew it, people were knocking at our door, requesting demos, requesting presentations. And I turned that um, posting of my content, my my social media journey into sales opportunities. And uh, my boss, I ca caught his attention and he said, how are you doing this? Like, how are you, you know, prompting people to buy your product? And I said, well, I'm just documenting my journey on LinkedIn and I'm posting what I'm doing just organically. This is what I'm doing. This is where I'm at. I'm, you know, sponsoring this charity event, et cetera. And he's like, you've got something here. So at 25 years old, I closed $2 million of transactions for my, um, you know, private members only network. And I built all of that on LinkedIn and Facebook. So this was back in 2009, super, super early. So with that, I started my own self-branding journey, started to kind of brand myself and people recognized me as the car club or the private members only club girl. And then I got poached and, uh, joined a tequila company and launched their brand in South Florida. So I was a market manager for Rio Azul Tequila in the state of South Florida and quickly self-branded as the tequila girl. So people knew me then uh, there, then and there as, oh, that's Rio Azul Tequila. And so kind of self-branding has been part of my evolution on social media. And now if you recognize uh, me from social behavior, we follow our website or follow our social media I'm in there a lot and I'm always kind of self-branding as CEO of social behavior, women-owned business, et cetera. And, and that's just my, um, kind of a little bit of my core background on social media and how I got started. So we were one of the first female owned social media agencies in Houston. We are celebrating eight years in business in June. And we have actually a team of volunteers that are here with us today that are uh, part of my team and also some of my team members that are exhibiting with me today as well. So, and then I also want to let you guys know, I'm not that Karen. I don't even know why we started trending with my name and I'm a Latina Karen. It's like, mom, what, what happened? I ask her all the time, but just want to get that out of the way. So I want to talk to you today. We're going to talk a, a lot about social media, right? And this class is kind of broken up into two sections. It's the pillars of social, and then I'm going to close it out with influencers. But the pillars of social media, I know you guys have heard about social media. There's so many questions. Social media in itself as an industry, the rules of social media are still being written. The platforms are still being developed. There's new technology that comes out every day. We had someone come to our table earlier and ask us, well, how do you keep up with the trending topics? How do you keep up with um, the, the changes, the programming, the software that evolves every single day? And sometimes we, are, we're, we have to be early adapters in social because things change daily. And our team is right there at the, uh, at the forefront of that. So we're able to, you know, take what Instagram puts out, oh, new new process on doing stories, new reels, new this, new that, new stickers for your, um, for your stories. And we're, we're there, we're right in front of it all the time. So 
you know, social media just itself is always evol evolving. But the core components of social media never change and never have changed and are still the same. And you cannot miss that. So the four pillars of social media, there used to be three. Fourth pillar was introduced, you know, probably, probably introduced heavily about three years ago. But for us, we're just now recognizing it as a fourth pillar, not us itself, but the industry itself is now recognizing influence. But the three core pillars of social media have always been content, engagement, and ads, paid traffic. So let's just talk about it at large, and I'm going to go into each section and break it down for you. But content in itself is just the visual imagery. It can be a video, it can be a static image, and I'm not even talking about the specifics of that. I'm just talking about the visual aspect and the content copy, which we know in social media as a caption, not to be confused with the closed captioning or captioning in a video. So just content copy captions for social media are very different than content for a blog, content for a website. Engagement. Uh, engagement is actually what prompts the algorithm. So a lot of people think, all right, social media is my content. I'm going to post something up on Facebook and then it's going to do its thing and I'm going to walk away from it. No, that's actually your prompt to start working on your engagement because your engagement is actually what prompts the algorithm. The way that you engage on the platform, the way that you respond to your messages, to your comments, the way that you like your comments, the way that you respond to your reviews, on social listings, that's actually how you prompt the algorithm. You're letting the platform that you're on, Instagram, Facebook, that you want to participate, that you want to play in their in their turf by performing engagement. And so this is actually a very often neglected part of social media and something that you should be heavily focused on if you're not already having someone on your team or maybe you yourself, if it's your own account, managing this engagement portal. I can't uh, really understand when brands spend all this money on the content creation aspect of it, drop their content, put a caption, schedule it on Hootsuite, and then walk away from it. So that is actually um, not recommended. I think engagement often gets very neglected. And engagement is a two-way street. When I tell you, you got to reply to the comments, reply to your messages, that's actually you addressing inbound engagement. But platforms like Twitter, platforms like Instagram allow you to perform what's called outbound engagement. And that's an open market where you as a brand or as a person can actually go out and engage with other people based on their interests, based on the hashtags they use, based on a demographic, um, based, on, based on a geographical area. And so that's called outbound engagement. And then paid ads, we've heard a lot of speeches um, on the panels over the last couple of days on paid ads. You know, what is paid ads? The way that we use it on social media is we call it paid engagement. So content is actually free to publish. Engagement is free to do, meaning that anyone can post any content for free. But paid ads is the way to pay to play on social media, and it's paid engagement. So paid ads allow you to target different behaviors, demographics, geographical areas, and you're going to create those desired conversions now by just letting Facebook and Instagram or whatever platform you choose know who you want to target. And you're going to use their platforms um, to help you reach those, those goals. And then influence, last but not least, is in a very rapidly evolving category. But it's been around forever, right? We see Michael Phelps, like paid athlete campaigns. Those, those have been influencers. We just didn't recognize them. They were ambassadors. They were, you know, paid endorsements. But we didn't really have a name for it on social. Now we do. But an influencer is a user. And it can range. Like people ask me all the time, do I qualify to be an influencer? I have a 1,000 followers. Yes, you do. Yes, you do if you have a highly engaged audience. At any rate, at any follower count, you can be considered an influencer if you are influencing people with your content, with your story, with your, with your social media profile. And so that influencer creates engagement by publicly endorsing your brand product service to their audience. Sometimes you can accidentally engage, uh, be an influencer. Maybe you're an influencer now and you're just doing it because you love this water so much and you post about it all the time and you don't even know, but you're just influencing people to drink this water. Um, so 
with that, uh, now that I've gone over the four pillars, I'm just going to dive right in to content. So like I mentioned uh, in the last uh, slide, content with regards to social media is just a combination of visuals and imagery and caption copy that is published across all social media platforms. And those platforms can be Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, TikTok, Snapchat, Twitter, YouTube, and you name it. Clubhouse is also a platform. I was talking to someone yesterday about Clubhouse and they were like, what's Clubhouse? They didn't even know that Clubhouse, which is a social listening media platform, existed. So a lot of platforms, but the top two, obviously, that dominate the industry are Instagram and Facebook. Close third today is TikTok, the one that dominates professional content, professional uh, professionals on social media is LinkedIn, of course. But these platforms are all important um, because they all serve a different purpose. They all have a different um, type of user in it. They have a different way that they deliver the content. But again, the pillars is all the same. It's still content engagement and ads. And But the type of content that you publish, that's different. That can vary. There's so much content that can be created uh, to publish on any platform. And that is those the different types of those contents can be organic content, which is real time stuff. What's happening right now? Like you're here, you're at Digimarcon, you should get on stage after I get off and or after the conference and take a photo and document that. That's real time organic content. That is the most, the highest quality, the most premium type of content that you can publish is real time content because it's rich. It's rich. You took it right then and there. You just posted it live. People are connecting with you in real time. And that feels real. People like real on social media. You can also stage content or produce content. There's some awesome video company uh, exhibiting here that actually that's what they do. They do produced, you know, type of video content. And that content just is very curated and it helps to tell your story. 60 second video, 30 second video, highly curated, highly, you know, produced content is also great because that's just where you're really defining your messaging and you're going to say, I'm going to put this out there and I'm going to, um, you know, tell my story this way. The third type of content that I like to highlight is user generated content. And to me, that is probably a second type of premium, premium content that user generated content is short for how people are consuming your brand and product. So let's just say, for example, that I manufacture this water and I'm the owner of VP Water. And I'm gonna post it on my VP Water page the way that I want you to see it. But when I go to a user or they find my product in the stores and they post a picture, they post a selfie and say, this is my favorite water, that is priceless content. That's what's called user-generated content because that's how they're consuming your water. And I didn't have to pay. I didn't have to tell you, hey, this isn't a paid campaign. This is just some user literally generating content for me. And that's priceless. So that user-generated content is, is amazing. And when you have an active social media channel that constantly supports engagement and supports users cross-sharing content to your platform, you start to generate that user generated content for free. And that's the best type of content out there. Now, another content that we're seeing heavily, heavily generated and, and being endorsed or created by brands is employee generated content. And it's actually a new term. I think it's, I'm just seeing it kind of come, come to light in the last couple of years, but employee generated content with the increase of the great resignation, um, people just, you know, picking up a new career overnight, maybe going back into the workforce. There's a lot of turnover and brands and companies are really wanting to highlight their employees, their employee culture on social media. And they're prompting their employees to go and post content saying, I work at this water company. I work at VP Water and I love it here. And that's employee generated content. And that content should also be prompted internally because I could tell all day long one of my employees, hey, get up here, I'm gonna take your picture. But if I had to create that, that didn't come from them organically. But when you really highlight, want to highlight your culture, you really wanna prompt your employees to support your culture with um, some internal content of, of their own. 
And then you can cross post that as employee generated content, highly valuable content there as well. And then obviously we can't leave out the two types of content that are very, very, very highly engaging, especially in today's times, which are video, micro video and long format video. Long format video tends to do well on YouTube, although I don't know if you know this, but YouTube Shorts is the TikTok of YouTube. And I was just talking to someone yesterday about it and they said, YouTube has a TikTok now? And yes, they do. And that's called YouTube Shorts. So if you are active on YouTube or you have a handful of subscribers, you definitely want to start posting whatever reel, whatever you're posting to reels and TikTok, go ahead and get that up on YouTube Shorts and see what it does. I only recommend that for people that have, for users that have a high amount of subscribers, because you're not going to get discovered on YouTube Shorts. But if you have a substantial amount of subscribers, your content will go very, very, very far and it, and it has potential to go viral. So you can go viral today um, with content. Now, if you went viral, if you got on TikTok in March of 2020 at the beginning of the pandemic and you started posting your TikTok content, you most likely have tens of thousands of followers because TikTok just pushed, uh, pushed people up in the algorithm organically. They just said, come here and play. We're going to make you famous. We're going to do all the work for you. And they created a platform specifically to push users' content um, into a, a viral uh, phenomenon. And so if you didn't go viral on TikTok in 2020, you can now go into YouTube Shorts and try and see if that works for you. So, you know, a lot of times that I said a lot about content. I talked to you about the content platforms. I talked to you about the content types, but now you're probably wondering like, well, what type of content will I create or what type of content will I post? And creating content in general can be very fatiguing, especially if you don't have like a content strategy. So this is a screenshot. This is something that you can screenshot and I encourage you to, or take a picture of, because this is how you're going to perform a content intake. This is a content intake that I would take to a client wondering, hmm, how do I build my content strategy? Well, this is going to take the fatigue out of it because once you identify these key uh, elements, you're going to have kind of a clear path to content. It's going to eliminate that content fatigue. So the first thing that you want to analyze is how, who is your target audience? You know, we need to identify that first because if it's a 35-year-old millennial mom living in Dallas, Texas, that's probably someone that lives on Instagram and you need to create Instagram forward content. But if your demographic is um, journalists or 50 plus uh, tech consultants, that person probably lives on Twitter. And now you can create Twitter specific content. So you want to really just button down who your demographic target audience is. Now, Think about upcoming campaigns. Like, what do you want to create awareness for? So right now, obviously, we have Father's Day. And the reason why I say that is because it's a universal holiday. And it doesn't matter if you're State Farm Insurance or if you're a tech company or if you're a water brand, you can create content around Father's Day. So think about some upcoming campaigns that you can just kind of hone in on and that you want to create awareness for. Maybe you're a charitable company and you have a community, you know, event coming up that you're giving back a scholarship to the community. You can create a content campaign just for that because what you don't want to do is give away a scholarship in your community and have no one know about it because you only posted about it one time. So you can actually create a whole content campaign around an upcoming event or anything that you want to create awareness for. I touched on local community involvement. That's very important. So, you know, obviously uh, doing community car washes is something that we work with a brand that all they do is community gift bags. It's a gas station. Like they're not really trying to sell you gas because they know everybody needs gas. They just want you to know them because they do community car washes. They do blood drives. They do a lot of giving back. And they want you to support the brand because of that charitable element. So that local community involvement is also a way for you to create your content strategy. And think about seasonal trends in your business. You know, maybe there's a conference every year that you go to. Maybe you guys are going to be exhibiting at Digimarcon. You need to not post about it on the day that you get there. You need to post about it a month before 
two weeks before, the week before, three days prior, the day of, and don't forget your recap the day after. So that's a whole content campaign that can run you one month. And you literally didn't have to invent the wheel. And like, what are we going to post on this day? No, we're running a content campaign right now. And you can, you know, write that wave um, based on all of these things. So upcoming campaigns, local community involvement, seasonal trends in your business. And then you can also tie in promotional offers or sales. So if every year I give buy one, get one free waters at Costco on National Earth Day or Water Day, because I'm going to give you know, some of that back to a foundation that supports, you know, earth conservation, then I want to create a campaign for that. And that can be a promotional offer, promotional sale campaign. In all of these content opportunities, you want to keep something very, very uniform. And that is your brand tone and your brand colors. So those things always are going to remain uniform the way that you speak to your audience. So you're not going to be like, hey, how's it going one day? And the next day, to whom this may concern, you know, very formal. You want to keep that unified brand tone throughout all your content um, across your platforms, but you can tweak that accordingly to Twitter or maybe Instagram, you know, sprinkle in some emoji use, but you want to stay uniform in your brand tone. And a lot of people really struggle with that. They're like, but... I'm Mustang Cat. I don't know what my brand tone is, or maybe your corporate guidelines don't have that defined. Well, you want to ask yourself this simple question and just think about three key words that define your business, that define your brand. You know, for us, we're women, we are uh, social, we are pink. So if you look at our social media, you're going to see women being social, always wearing pink. And that's on brand for us. Now, one secret that I'm going to tell you uh, overall in general as it, as it applies to content is the secret to content is actually telling, not selling. And so in all these things that I just mentioned, all of these content opportunities, you never want to say bye, 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 bye. You're actually just telling your story because telling, not selling is what works. And to go back to how I started my journey in marketing, when I sold those $2 million worth of memberships via social media channels, I never once said, buy this. I never once said, I have an offer for you. I said, this is my life. If this interests you and you want to live this way, you know, message me. But I never said, bye, 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 because that's not the way that the consumer wants to consume your product. So you want to just focus on telling your story. Even when we work with clients, sometimes they're like, we really need to push this. We really need to push this new falafel platter we just rolled out at, you know, halal guys. And our approach is going to be, we're really going to tell the story of how amazing and how good and how, you know, crispy it is on the outside and, and just pillowy and doughy on the inside before we say, bye, 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 this falafel, because that's not what we're trying to do, we're trying to tell your story, get people excited about what it is that you offer rather than pushing them on an offer. All right. So that sums up content. Make sure you're writing down all your questions and, um, you know, ask me at the end. I did want to kind of also give you a very, very narrow content opportunity that presents itself from time to time. And actually, I think like every other day now, so no, it's not time to time. It's just trending topics. So you know what's happening right now. Everyone on social media is hopping on the Uvalde, you know, sending out an emotional message. And that's something that in our agency, we have to be really get in front of. When we see these trends kind of evolving, you know, you can decide to be silent. You can decide to not say anything at all. That's totally fine. But these narrow content opportunities do present themselves from time to time. And it's not even just with the tragic situations like what's happening now, although I'm seeing hundreds and hundreds of brands and companies rallying behind what's happening and, and, and echoing their support for, for the situation at hand, you can actually hop on trends like Will Smith slapping Chris Rock. That was a huge trending opportunity. 
And you can actually hop on that and create a meme from that. So there are very narrow content opportunities that are kind of like have a two to three day viral window that you can actually, once you see it happening, jump in and kind of hop on. And, um, you know, culture trends as well are trending topics, memes, anything that's going viral is something that presents itself in content that will allow you to just kind of uh, write the coattails off. So before I move on, I just want you to always remember to be very intentional with your content and content plan so that you can, you know, fight content fatigue. And the, the best way to fight that is to be strategic about your content. And remember, it's telling, not selling. So don't just go out there trying to sell somebody something. Tell your story. And with that, I'm going to move on to engagement. So I talked to you guys in the beginning when I said we're going to talk about these four pillars. Content is obviously what you're putting out there. But engagement is the most ignored part of social media. And you're thinking, but like, why do I have to engage? I already did the work. All the work was in the content planning. All the work was in me writing a caption and publishing and getting it out there. No, this is the second most important work that you have to do on social media. Because this is actually you letting Instagram and Facebook know that you want to play the game. You want to prompt the algorithm to work for you. So that is engagement. And engagement is actually a two-way street. It's inbound and outbound. And engagement can include anything, like I mentioned earlier, replying to your comments, maybe sending out outbound DMs, starting conversations, responding to reviews, saving posts. Every time that you're scrolling on social media and you see something you like and you say, I want to go back to this later, and you save it, you're telling Instagram that you like that person's content. Now Instagram's going to serve you more of their content but Instagram's also going to take that content and push it out to even more people because they're saying, wow, people are really saving this content. We need more people in the world to see it. So you're prompting the algorithm to work for you. So if you are posting something out there, maybe something that's date specific, event specific, you want to let your audience know, hey, save this post for later because that's going to not only help you, but also help them see your content a little bit more because of them going in and manually hit, hitting that safe post. Now, like I mentioned, inbound and outbound engagement are two different channels of engagement. Inbound's what's coming in. That's someone messaging a business page or someone writing a comment. But the way that you engage with that is you reply to that comment and you reply to that message. Now, on Facebook, that's as far as you can go. Because Facebook does not allow a brand, product, business, professional page to then go and say, I'm going to start a conversation with this person now, uh, this random person on Facebook. It doesn't let you do that. But Twitter and Instagram do. TikTok does. So that means that if you are, for example, what is my water called again? VP Water. And you are running a campaign giving back uh, to this, baby formula shortage, which is a trending topic right now. And you're saying, I want all these new moms to know about my water because every percentage of proceeds is going back to this baby formula. It's a lot of layers there. Maybe don't run with that one. But when you are finding your audience, you can hashtag new moms. You can hashtag expecting moms. You can search for hashtag, you know, pregnant or my pregnancy journey and find moms and find communities on these platforms where you can now engage with them. It's an open field. It's an open field. And so I do encourage businesses to hire an engagement strategist or maybe have someone on their team that does social to not just only focus on what they're putting out, but focus on the engagement aspect of things. Focus on replying to comments, on replying to inquiries, on maybe going out and doing some outbound engagement, engaging with this audience. So you have no reason to not be successful on social media, especially on those three platforms, because it is an open field uh, of opportunity. You can engage with that audience, like I mentioned, via searching hashtags, or maybe you're doing something that's very specific to a local market or a small city, a small town, and you can search that on the location search and literally find those um, unique individuals. 
that opportunity is presented, like I mentioned, on certain platforms, but great ones would be Instagram, Twitter, uh, TikTok, uh, just to name a few. Facebook does not allow you to do that. Uh, LinkedIn does allow you to connect with outbound professionals. It is kind of restricted, so you want to upgrade your plans in order for it to do that, but it serves the same purpose, okay? Engagement is inbound and outbound. Now, you can also spark a conversation. So let's say, what do you do once you find these moms? You can actually message them or leave a comment under their last post saying, hey, we have a great campaign going on right now. We're giving formula to moms in need. Go to the link in our bio, and maybe that's where they can make a donation or buy your product and get behind a brand that they now support because maybe this is an expecting mom that's like not going to want to run into the problem of not having formula. So spark that conversation. That's what engagement does, you know. And um, you can also promote engagement. Let's say that you're saying you probably are new to content, you just started your content campaign, and you don't even know how to actually prompt engagement. There are some ways that you can prompt engagement with a giveaway. You can prompt engagement with um, a contest, a challenge, a broadcasted event. Maybe you're this water brand and you know that there's a big celebrity that's going to support my water. And maybe you go on live with them. Maybe th you do that instead of just slapping their picture on the bottle or on your social and saying, yeah, they support this brand. No, go live with them. Create a campaign about your live stream event. And those are ways that you can actually prompt engagement. So you can actually create it just by doing those things, running a challenge, starting a challenge, running a contest, uh, hosting a giveaway. I think we spoke to a gentleman yesterday that's creating an app just for social media challenges. So that was pretty cool. Um, so yeah, user engagement is, you know, meant to enhance your consumer experience on your social media channel. So you want to make sure that you're addressing their comments, messages. When I see a brand, for example, I'll give you an example. I'm walking into um, HEB and I see this product that I really, really like. And I'm thinking, I tag the brand and I tag HEB and I'm saying, wow, HEB now, now carries my favorite coconut water. I tag HEB and five minutes later, guess what? HEB is messaging me the social media person that they're paying to do their engagement, but I feel like HEB is messaging me. And I love HEB, you know, and and it's brands like that that you want to get behind because they're building your, tr they're earning your trust. They're building engagement with you. They're building your confidence in their brand because they're engaging with you on the spot. I was at a conference at South by Southwest marketing conference and the CMO of Domino's Pizza was on a panel and I tagged her and I tagged Domino's and Domino's Pizza literally wrote me back. So we love her. We're so glad you're there. What an amazing social media engagement team they have to just be able to respond five minutes later on a Saturday morning and say, wow, thanks for supporting our brand. I don't even like Domino's, but now I do, you know, because they're engaging with me. So you know, spark a conversation. You need to really look at your social media audience as your social media net worth. So that is your social media network, your net worth. You really need to look at them like that. And when you do, you'll see the value in engaging with them. All right. So we've covered content, covered engagement, going to jump into ads, save your questions for the end. Um, definitely going to make some time to answer everything. And now I'm going to jump into paid ads, and then we're going to close out with influencers. So I'll, paid ad, I'll, I'll kind of keep paid ads pretty brief. But ads are a tried and true method of generating conversions, engagement, awareness, leads, etc. The reason why I say it's tried and true is because it works. Like there's no undeniable doubt that it, does, that it doesn't work. But ad costs are rising. In the beginning of 2020, we saw Facebook kind of dropping their ad rates, dropping their ad costs because that was the beginning of the pandemic. And they were like, we're going to let brands advertise. Businesses need our help. And they did a lot of campaigns and pushes. Fast forward to 2022, there's a rising cost of ads. And there's also a lot of, there's also been a lot of privacy law changes, which means that I can no longer go into Facebook and say, I want to reach a person that lives in River Oaks, you know, 
um, community in a house of $5 million va value and up. But I used to could, and I could put their zip code and I could put, you know, uh, get very specific. But now there's been changes in privacy laws that have forced marketers to kind of lean into more creative ways of reaching users. So we've actually kind of shifted gears with that as well. And although we do still create ads for different customers, we like to push them and lean into maybe creating some viral content and starting a viral content um, trend or maybe leveraging their ad spend budget with influencers. And we think that those ad dollars might be better spent. However, I do still encourage you to kind of complement any social media strategy with a paid ad campaign, even if it's just to give your content a lift. And so when I say that, I mean that you can create an ad strategy that's very targeted, very in-depth. I'm still going to go after these users. I still want them to hit my landing page. I still want them to go to my lead funnel or this content's performing really well and my content's actually going viral across TikTok and Instagram, but I do still want that lift because I want to reach my audience that I built on Facebook over the last 10 years. So I'm going to create an ad campaign of just $1,000 and go ahead and push my content out on Facebook to my existing audience. Because if you don't already know, the, um, the percentage of people that are seeing your content, despite how many followers you have, is very, very narrow. It is very unlikely that organically my content reaches my 11,000 followers on a daily basis because that's just not the way the algorithm is set up. So unless I post some content that goes viral, I'll reach my audience and then some, but on a day-to-day -day basis, I'm going to reach a very narrow 1% to 5% of my audience, and those are the people that are going to be engaging with me. But if you set an ad budget and create an ad campaign, you can actually reach people on a, on a broader level uh, and set a desired conversion. And again, there are so many cool technologies, so many tools available for marketers where you can leverage your ad strategy to work in your favor. And you can use a pixel to remember the unique identity of each user. You've all seen the tool that says, you know, do you accept these cookies? And those cookies are, it's a retargeting technology when you go on any website that says, we're going to remember who, you know, Aubrey is. He just used an example. And then we know Aubrey went to the VNS water website, VP. I keep messing up my water, guys. I got to get my brand, <laughs> my brand name correct. Okay. We're going to create an ad. Uh, Aubrey's going to go to my VP water website. And I'm going to have an ad running and then I'm going to retarget the ad to Aubrey. So even after she leaves my website, it's like, wait, I was just thinking about that water. No, you weren't. You were just on the website and you accepted the cookies and now I got you with my ad. So thank you for accepting those cookies because I was able to work you into my ad pixel and reserve you with an ad. So again, very strategic ways, a lot of layers here, a lot to unpack when it comes to you know, what an ad campaign can do, what an ad strategy can do. It is, you know, it can go as far as you want it to go, but there are certain backend technologies and tools that can be built in to make it even a more robust ad strategy. Something that I always urge marketers to do when you're building out an ad strategy is again, don't run an ad campaign with promotional content, run an ad campaign with compelling content, with creative content, Content that just outperformed on Instagram, that looks good, that is performing very well. Because the same approach is important here, that we're telling, not selling. The ad is going to sell itself if you have the story to tell, if you have a really compelling content piece. So maybe I run an ad for my water, not saying we're a new water brand just founded at Digimarcon, Houston, Texas. We're actually an ad water brand that's giving back to moms in need. And people are going to stop scrolling and say, well, I like the sound of that because, you know, we all want to help moms in need. So get creative with your content. Measure the results. You can't gauge what you don't measure. So something that I always struggle with marketers uh, when working on ad campaigns or ad strategies, we are 
you know, asking them, well, how did this ad perform? You said you spent a thousand dollars on Facebook and you're, you're so proud that you're spending $10,000 on Facebook a month. But what did that do for you? Oh, I don't know. It was like, it didn't do anything, but did you measure the results? Did you create a campaign strategy that says, if I get 10,000 new Instagram followers from these $10,000, that's going to, that's going to make sense to me. And that would actually be amazing if you could tie that back, right? But a lot of marketers are spending advertising dollars without actually knowing what to measure. So always, always deploy your ad strategy with some measurable, uh, you know, a measurable campaign. Set an intention for it. Be intentional with your marketing, period. You know, I said in the content conversation, be intentional with your content. And uh, you can't, you can't, you know, Gauge what you don't measure. So measure your results to make sure it's working for you. I tell customers all the time, we start with a small blanket amount of ad dollars, a small ad budget. And if whatever works from that small trial campaign, we're going to replicate that. Let's shift all our budget to what actually does work because that's what we want. We want measurable results. All right. So I'm going to close the chapter and we're going to get into the last topic, which is influencers. The most exciting thing that I like to talk about right now specifically, because it is just an evolving category. So hold any questions for ads until the end. I'm going to wrap, start to wrap this up in about um, seven minutes. So influencers. Oh my God. Where do you even start? Influencers were kind of like the plague five years ago, like they were, you know, high maintenance, they were entitled foodies that used to go to a restaurant, like, no, you owe me, you serve me. But in 2020, we started to see the turn of that. The influencer kind of evolved from this entitled, you know, bratty blogger that used to post cute pics on Instagram to like your neighbor. And your everyday influencer is just an everyday social media user. And so brands started to kind of see the opportunity with the influencer category, and we started to see it as well. So two years ago, I opened up an influencer department and uh, an influencer marketing agency, and I started to really tap into how do we leverage these influencers with these restaurants that are on the brink of going out of business at the start of the pandemic? Restaurants were closing. You couldn't do any indoor dining. All traditional marketing that we knew and traditional social media that we knew was kind of like, yes, that's still great, but that's not going to do it right now because people can't even step inside restaurants. And so we deployed influencer strategies for our clients and our particularly restaurants by sending to the tune of 10 influencers per day to go eat and pick up food. And we begged and said, please do this. You know, we'll comp your meals. We know it's not safe right now. You can't even go inside restaurants. That was two years ago. Can you believe that? But we're going to, you know, we need your support because these brands, these restaurants that maybe did paid campaigns with you in the past are about on the brink of closing. And so influencers really started to rally for products and brands that they believed in. And we started sending them out by the masses. And in doing that, we built a network uh, in Houston alone of 800 influencers that we currently work with. And this community is of influencers are just very, they, they vary by number of followers, by maybe their demographic, their audience. But the thing is that all influencers are a good fit for all brands. Like there's no discrepancy in who's good or who's not. It's who's creating quality content, who's got great engagement, and who loves my brand, and that's who we want to work with. So as of 2020, the influencer industry has prompted a new category. We know B2C. We know B2B. But now there's C2C, creator to consumer. This is a whole new industry, a whole new category. So the influencer industry has disrupted what we know, what we knew in the marketing world. And it's created its own new category. So 
This category is rapidly evolving. The demand for influencers and creators and for brands are stepping in saying we're reallocating budgets and we're going to spend on influencers. That's actually driving up the cost too because there's more of a demand for influencers and that's driving up the cost in the creator space. And so now the influencers are actually, you know, demanding to be paid for their creative output. And brands are responding in their favor, saying, you know what, you're right, Aubrey. You met, you made this amazing content piece for me. You had like went viral. I am going to compensate you for your time and for your output, your creative output and your mind. Because again, it's almost like paying for that user generated content. So marketers, big brands are allocating bigger budgets to allow for paid campaigns within the creator industry. And Historically, we knew influencers as, all right, we've got influencer, username, Instagram username, you know, I love water, that's her name, and we're paying her to do a content piece with this. Historically, influencers were approached as one-time influencers, one-time campaigns, like, all right, we paid all these influencers, $500 a pop, we've got 100 posts going out, but now that's not how we want to do it anymore. Now we want to make all these influencers ambassadors. That's your new buzzword in the influencer world, which is we not only want them to post one time, but I need I Love Water to post 10 times a year about my water because that repetition is key. It is key for you. It is key for them because they're building that trust, building that continued awareness building that repetition and that brand affinity with their users. They're saying, man, I love water always talks about that water. That's the water that they're going to remember. So even today, the influencer category is still evolving from a one-time campaign, one-time post, one-time, you know, um, opportunity to now we want you to be a brand ambassador. Hell, we even want you to be an affiliate, which means I want you to earn commission on every single water that you sell for me. And the one-time influencers are now being sought out for these long-term partnerships and they're earning commissions on sales. And so now they're just as motivated as you to put money in their pocket and put money in your pocket because now they're earning as part of this partnership. So just came from Chicago. I was at a Sweets and Snacks, a consumer packaged good conference earlier this week. And I met with about 200 brands. All of them were launching, either launching a new product or had a consumer product that was a snack, right? I mean, I'm all snacked out. Like I cannot even look at a beef jerky packet. <laughs> like I'm just, whoo, a lot of snacks. I told you I met about 200 brands. And it was interesting because we're talking to them and we're asking them, do you know about, do you guys sell on Amazon? They said, yeah, we're on Amazon. Well, do you know about the Amazon Associates or the Amazon Influencer Program? No. I'm like, you know influencers can get behind your product and literally link it to their Amazon Associates link or their Amazon Influencer Hub and literally make money off of your product and you don't pay a dime. And they were like, what? I mean, it was mind boggling to them. But these brands are coming out, they're being sold on Amazon, and they don't know that users like me that are Amazon influencers can actually make money off of every sale of this water that I backlink on my Amazon hub, and it costs that brand nothing. So this industry, this category is still just continuously evolving. Marketers are not really honed in on all the potential, all the opportunity that exists within the creator industry. And that is why um, agencies like us exist, to make them aware of all the opportunities that exist within the creator community. Now, TikTok honed in on that very early. So when they came to launch, they said, yes, we're on, um, they've got an amazing platform. And now brands are allocating a lot of their marketing dollars to TikTok and they're working with influencers in the creator community to create campaigns, but they're actually, um, TikTok actually rolled out their own creator platform. So you as a marketer can now go on TikTok and say, I want to work with 50 TikTok creators and this is my budget and TikTok will actually go and pitch your opportunity to them. 
and they can respond, set a rate. You can do the whole contract in there with them. You can actually see their link once they post it. And then now you get the data and the analytics of their campaign and what that did for you and your brand. There's so many layers, so many approaches to how to work with influencers, but I will just remind you that influencer outreach requires a very dedicated and delicate approach. If you're a brand, don't you dare go on Instagram, start messaging Aubrey about paying her $50 for the water because you don't even know if she likes the water and you don't even know if 50 bucks is going to offend her or not. So you want to make sure that you have a way to introduce your brand or product to an influencer very gently and ask them about their interests in an opportunity. Ask them if they do paid or any comp opportunities. I myself don't really do a lot of free product trade. I try to reserve my social media for my existing clients. However, there's brands that I support and adore like Carbock Beer. And they send me influencer kits all the time. And I'll post about it because I love Carbock and I have brand affinity towards them. And so there is a way for you to reach your target influencer and offer them uh, an opportunity to work with you. But you want to make sure that your approach is delicate and you're keeping their best interests in mind. So approach them with, you know, hey, are you open to any opportunities? Do you do anything for trade? Do you work for... Uh, what's your rate card? You know, if they if they are professionals, chances are they're going to reply back to you with their rate card. I charge this for a reel. I charge this for a static post. I charge this for, you know, a TikTok. Here's a combination package and all inclusive. And so, you know, approach them delicately. And um, that would be your best bet. So with that being said, I'm going to close out the influencer category. We've got about five minutes um, left in the presentation. I'll let you look at this kind of influencer timeline of what happens when an influencer receives a product or service and what happens after that. But uh, with that, I'm going to go ahead and open it up for questions uh, regarding today's presentation. All right. Hi there, my name is Sarah and I work for an internet service company. So my question is, um, what kind of content could an influencer create for a service-based company rather than like a physical product? I love this question. I actually, like Russ was saying, did the presentation in New York and someone had the exact same question. So what you can do is you can create an experience that's not insurance related at all. And so, for example, you host a cocktail party or a mixer or a meet, you know, Toro from the Texans or Orbit from the Astros party and, and align yourself with a bigger brand, someone that has great visibility on social media, host a unique event, and then label the hell out of the event with your brand sponsored by. And so when influencers do a recap, they're not going to say, I was invited to this really dull internet service party. It was like really boring. No, they invited me to hang out with Orbit from the Astros. Thank you so much at internet service company for inviting me. And so you create a totally unrelated event that ties into your brand. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Jordan's coming. I am a real tour. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know if to Can have, you speak into the mic, please? I don't know if to have my business page, like in Facebook, with the mix with the personal one. Okay. Uh, what is your recommendation? Yes. So she's a realtor business asking if you should have a business personal, page an and a personal page. You should have both. Okay. And whatever you post on your personal one, that is kind of telling your story that's content that is going to align with the potential buyer. Like I want to buy my home from her because she lives in Katy or she lives, she likes this restaurant or she, you know, is a mom, her kids go to this university, whatever would align you with the potential buyer is the best way to kind of cross share your personal content to your business page. Your business page is important because you can run ads like I talked about here. And then you can also measure the results of your campaign, your analytics. So that's very, very important to set up. All right. Any last takers? I've got about a minute left. No more questions. No further questions. 
All right. Well, thank you guys so much um, for this opportunity. Thank you, Aaron, Digimarcon. It's been amazing. I'm so, so thankful. And uh, I'll let Russ close this out. <laughs>